Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this, uh, well, last parallel session of the day. Uh, and this session is titled The Role of the Global Chinese uh, Diaspora Connecting with Overseas uh, Chinese. Well, this is, in a sense, a very general session, but also a very important session. I'm sure most of you have heard of, uh, for example, the Bamboo Network, namely the strings of uh, overseas Chinese, uh, expatriate Chinese uh, in Southeast Asia and beyond, how they, uh, for example, uh, effectuate investments and trade between China and, uh, and, and their respective countries. So we are gonna explore today how can the overseas Chinese contribute more to business, to society, to arts and culture, to music and to philosophy. We have four very distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, each of them would uh, make their presentation for approximately uh, 10 minutes and then we will be opening the floor up for uh, questions and answers. If you don't have questions, then I would try to come up with some questions. But please, your questions would take priority. Our first speaker is Mr. Albert Ong. He is the chair and founder and president of the UNESCAP ESBM Green Economy Task Force. Uh, and he's the president of uh, World Green Organization of Hong Kong. So, Mr. Albert Ong, perhaps you could start. Yeah, you could either speak here or you could use the podium if you like. Maybe I use the podium then. Okay. Hello. Yes. Testing. Uh, thank you. Um, Welcome you all to this last session. Um, allow me to just um, share the history of the overseas Chinese who has been residing in the past probably a thousand years, you know, all over the world, not just in Asia Pacific. Um, when we go back to the, the roots of, of, of Chinese, um, people will also think of art, culture, music, you know, a lot of things that the, the Chinese people has been bringing along over, overseas. And I think this is some of the, the, the things that has really breached up all the, all the people around the world. When they went to these countries and reside, you know, they develop, but at the same time, they have this Confucius uh, idea, which in rooted in them is to establish relationship with other people, other, other tribes or other uh, 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 people in other countries by bringing, you know, constructive uh, act, um, establishment into their country. But at the same time, you know, ha we having this culture of, you know, bringing peace, uh, bringing respect, and many, many other good things that the Confucius has, uh, has taught. Again, but this also uh, is, um, all these things are all also in compliance with what we have in our mind as a Buddhist. So, I mean, for the Asian, Asian country people, you know, most of us are either Mus uh, Buddhism or are also Muslim. Uh, we all share the same respect, you know, so uh, of, of living harmony, you know, uh, helping uh, people to each other. So this is what uh, Chinese are all about, and probably the whole of Asian people are all about, you know, helping each other, uh, having livelihood above all, you know, uh, helping each other, uh, which are more than important than the uh, economic growth. Uh, because in the past, uh, I think 500 years, even in, 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 in whole of Asia, um, or even around the world, you know, uh, there, there are Western countries or other overseas countries coming over to, to Asia. Either they co colonize or they have their own diff different reason uh, in invading countries. But probably most of the Asian countries have suffered in the past centuries. You know, even in China for 200 years, uh, when they closed up their doors 
uh, during the Qing Dynasty. So that's why the illiteracy rate went up and a lot of confusion. So that's why the whole, whole country at that time was in, 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 in a mess. But then after 200 years, after so many mishap, uh, people suffer, die, and also in, in, in the whole of uh, just concentrating in, in Asia, you know, uh, we can see the history. I mean, history says, uh, tell you the truth of what had, had happened. But somehow this is the era of Asia. Uh, the Chinese has been has long been, uh, you know, residing in all, m many different Southeast Asia countries, but at the same time, they, because of their roots, um, they went back, uh, uh, or they now still going back to to China to help, because they in, rooted in them in, in them they have this mindset of contributing or rebuilding their country. Okay, for me, I was born in Myanmar. I'm a Chinese. Myanmar born Chinese, but certainly I also have the heart. It's just like many overseas Chinese living in different countries in Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, uh, Thailand. We all have the heart of going back, or even not going back, is to, is to assist our Chinese people uh, in mainland, you know, to rebuild our country. So that's why our culture, cultural ties are so strong. And these, these are the, the, the one of the major factors, you know, that we have been taught by our ancestors, you know, to help, contribute, and do a lot of good things. They never go out and invade other countries, never do go out and do any bad things. So I think this is the, cult the, 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 the basis of all Chinese overseas, um, you know, it, deep rooted in their hearts is to contribute, you know, the, the Conf Conf Confucius uh, 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 taught the, the, the kind of peace and, and, and hopeful respect, you know, uh, to brought to people. So they're not just brought in to, to their own people, you know, to the Chinese people, but, but brought all these good ideas into other countries. So I think with that, we establish a very good tie with local people in each and every country. Uh, certainly because of the history which we told told us that they have not invaded or do anything bad to that any of these countries. So that's why there is a trust, there's an integrity issue there. Nowadays, around the world, what is happening now is that if you don't respect others, you know, what will happen? They will discard you. So th this, is the, this is a kind of a revolutionary era that we are entering into. You can choose not to respect others, but you will know the result. Okay, somebody will abandon you. So it's as, as what I have just um, uh, just learned from 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 our colleagues or our friends in in another session. We were talking about uh, Belt and Road. Belt and Road. Uh, um, in in the early days, they were talking about like whether it's like economic growth. Because of economic growth, they want to expand out. It's a it's economic pop, uh, uh, you know development program initiative. But actually, for for me, as what I have uh, known of of um, you know because I, I've been sp speaking to many of these co Chinese corporations and officials. What they have been trying to do certainly is to build roads, build schools build dams, build, build bridges, but they have all, even for these co contracting company, they also have a heart to help the local community. Okay, so, I mean, if you look, really talk to them, they are telling you, you know, it's not about money, it's about contribution, you know, and, and we were talking about, like, uh, the Belt and Road Program doesn't ask people or doesn't ask the the, the the country, the government, to pay 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 the money to you. You know they do it unconditionally somehow. Some of course they are. Uh, this is uh, these are all loans. But anyhow, the overall approach of of these initiatives are based on goodness. Okay, and this is very unusual in in <laughs> in this world nowadays. And certainly because, uh, frankly speaking many overseas Chinese really contributed to the well-being of China today. And this is one of the major factors. But I'm just trying to give you my, you know, a, a, just a, a brief 
uh, understand uh, what I have learned in, in the past uh, with, with, with many overseas Chinese, especially as uh, me as an overseas Chinese that go back to China in the past 50 years. Uh, we've seen the, the, um, you know, the problem that they have encountered 50 years ago, 40 years ago, especially in the past 10 years, there's a very big changes the way how they do things now. So and anyhow, this is uh, only my humble sharing with you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ong, for uh, pointing out some of the characteristics of overseas Chinese, respect, harmony, helping each other, and so on, and their willingness uh, in the process of uh, you know, seeing China's uh, growth, and China in turn in its uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, had a lot of contributions to those uh, countries uh, which, uh, uh, which was involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. Our next speaker is my good friend, Edmund. Edmund Yeo, JP. He is the chair of the Chinese Information and Advice Center and former councillor of the London Borough of Ealing in the United Kingdom. So, Edmund. Well, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Okay. Very good afternoon to all of you. Um, where do you want me to start? Oh, how shall I start? It's a very diverse but very important topic, uh, like the Chair said. Uh, but let me start by saying, by way of introduction, I am made in Kuala Lumpur. I'm a totally Malaysian. I have been in the UK for about 42 years, although you know I come back very often, uh, but I'm in touch with uh, uh, my folks here in Malaysia. Okay, where do I start? When I first went to the UK, the Chinese diaspora, as I, as I remember, the census was about, I think about 80,000 people throughout the whole of the United Kingdom that makes up, uh, that is made up of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And the Malaysian population, mainly then of uh, students like myself, I think we were about like 30,000, 30, and that's a lot in the 1980s. It has since now grown. I can tell you the recent census for the Chinese, uh, 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 categorized as Chinese, is about, is about 2 million. It's still small because the, the Asians uh, and the, uh, the, the black African co community is, is very large. The Malaysian diaspora, I think, is about at least 80,000. And again, a lot of students, but a lot of them now has become professionals and settled down there with families and careers. That's the initial picture I want to tell you. Uh, but where I can start is uh, this morning when we heard from Tun Sri Datuk Sri Rice, he said China is the future. And I don't want you to doubt that. That's true. Although there'll be a lot of distractions, and I hope uh, within this short time I can uh, spell out some of them to you. Uh, we are a country that is no different from, as a country in the United Kingdom, and as a home country, you, England, where I am, and where London is, we are no different from any of the other countries prevailing now with problems uh, facilitated by the war in Ukraine, and, and uh, then the supply chains, and the cost of fuel, the cost of living is the top, top agenda, agenda in, in, in UK now. Uh, people are suffering. But that's, that's not trying to tell you a very bad picture because uh, my brother just came back from the States and he said people are lying on the street, sleeping homeless. And that's exactly the same. Don't know much about KL, I haven't seen much, but uh, it happens in a big city like London, inevitably. And, and it's a very sad thing because while America thinks they are great, UK thinks they're great, and uh, you know, this is happening. And in a, a welfare state like the UK, I, I personally believe it shouldn't happen, but it does. Because the welfare state somehow, right, there, there are deficiencies in that system, but I, I, I'm not gonna talk about that, there's not a forum for that. But basically, we have all these problems like anybody else. So where do the Chinese diaspora uh, 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 contributes and uh, do it and uh, 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 
perhaps lead the way. It's, it's basically we are known to be a very self-sufficient, if unfortunately insular or quiet sort of community in, in, the, in, in the big foreign place like UK. We are quite, we are quite um, self-sufficient, I think. All right, we, we don't want to be without a job. We don't want to be unemployed. We, we choose not to go on the dole, many of us, I think. Uh, we are quite enterprising. We kick our backsides and, uh, you know, we go out to work we, or we create work or we create a business and that's us. Our kids, the same. They are known in the UK, the Chinese community is known to be very good academically, very good at studies, excel in studies. Uh, I myself bring a, 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 you know, a, a, a small group to the Prime Minister's uh, uh, office in Downing Street. Uh, to be appreciated, you know, and uh, this is the situation. Uh, even with uh, with uh, with uh, ac the academic side, uh, which I believe are, is the is some of that values that has a non-white uh, uh, culture. We that's where we excel. Like the Asians, we believe in the family values, all right, and we believe in in going to school and study hard and work hard go on and get a good job right, and become a professional. And therefore, you can see the uh, involvement now. In the old days, the Chinese community in the UK was definitely known to be the takeaways and the catering and the restaurants and the waiters and the chefs. Today, actually, if you want to come to the UK and if you're a chef or a waiter, you'll be welcome if, <laughs> with the proper working permit, I must say. All right? You must have a proper document. I'm not here to encourage you to go there illegally. But... Uh, a lot of the others, the point I'm trying to under, uh, underline is, a lot of the others now are professionals. They are accountants, lawyers, doctors, you name it. And that's because of that, that hard work they do as a student and, and progress from that. Okay, so that's the situation uh, in terms of the diaspora there. Uh, we, politically, we've got problems, as you can see. I mean, when I come back, the first thing is people ask me, my friends ask me, hey, how come uh, you got five, uh, four prime ministers, keep changing prime ministers, or you change clothes? And that, that's true, I mean, but that's the beauty of our democratic system in the UK. Right? Over, the, over the very many, over the five years, we have had four prime ministers. Over the last four years, we have five chancellors. But that's okay, you know, that's the way our democracy works. And you see, it's still solid, it's not crumbled. Of course, we're laden with a lot of debts now because after the pandemic, and, and uh, the UK government is, is known to be uh, 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 magnanimous, uh, generous. We have fellow schemes that pay you when you don't work, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, we, we encourage people to go and spend money and, and the government give you 10 pounds to go and spend the first 10 pounds on them, that kind of thing. So, but we are laden with a lot of debts now in the trillions. And that's why uh, you've seen a change of, uh, if not if not government, which we, we, we have our next election in two years' time, but you have had the prime ministers, you have different you know different agendas, different different proposals, all right, to try and make the country work. This is where we are. So there are opportunities. I've told you you know the downside, uh, the negative side, but there are opportunities, uh, you know. Uh, and like I say, you know, that, that's just simply not enough people to work. Our um, unemployment is low, but there's not enough job, uh, it's not, not enough job, there's enough, not enough workers to go and do the job. Restaurants are crying. They need waiters, they need chefs. Of course, there are other problems that come with, comes with it, like, for example, immigration is a good, good example. I mean, uh, there are immigration policies that, that deters you. I mean, over the years, you, you've seen how, how you know, uh, uh, it has evolved, and uh, now we even send people, refugees coming in. We got a problem, seriously. We have, we have people coming across the, 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 the French Channel. Uh, in the old days, I, the, the figures I pick up from the, from the news is we had about 20,000 20, people a, a year, illegal boat uh, 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 refugees, they call them uh, immig economic immigrants. They come down, but today we're talking about 40 over 1,000 people thus far this year, well, it's the end of the year now, so it's nearly double. And to put these people, and we've got that, that sort of liberal policy to, to uh, try and accommodate you until you're proven not to be qualified under whatever categories, refugee, political asylum seekers, whatever. But to put these people, right now, as I talk, 
we have a bill of seven million pounds a day in hotel accommodation. Now that's a lot of money, okay? A lot of money because uh, when I first started and tell you that people homeless, and this is that kind of anti feeling that they will have now. Why are you putting people in the hotels and our people are sleeping on the streets? You know that kind of thing. And why taxpayers like us have to pay for for uh, uh, such liberal policies? But this is UK. That's what I think UK thinks is that makes them great Britain, but these are the various policies that you know, different countries, different governments take, and this is the route UK take. All right, but so, in terms of uh, the Chinese diaspora again, because of that growing population and that very great influx of uh, Chinese students over the last uh, 10, 15 years, you see, of course, that cultural element in terms of even food. In the old days, we just have Cantonese food. Now we have all sorts of food, you know, Sichuan and hot pot and whatnot. In the same way, um, uh, there are people who have got diverse talents, people who deal with music and bring in or introduce Chinese music, Chinese instruments that I've not even seen before. And, and that's good for us because they bring us to the forefront. So in a, in a very small way, we are changing as a community in the UK. We used to be watchless. People like me, we, were, we, we, we had no representation politically. People like me, I've become a councillor before. Right? And, and that makes a difference to the, the political landscape. Uh, today, I think we have two lords, two peers at the House of Lords, which is like equivalent to your, equivalent to your upper house. Right? And we've got one or two MPs, or trying to be MPs, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it's a slow progress, but it's happening. So this is where we are. If you have got the right papers, or you've got the right ambition, or you've got the right capital, you can come and try us. Okay? All right, I think I should end there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, to, uh, Edmund, for advising many of us don't, not to attempt this thing called uh, skipping aeroplane, to, uh, as uh, some of us local here would say. He described the Chinese diaspora in the United Kingdom as self-sufficient, enterprising, good in education, and stressing in family values. For Edmund, China is the future, um, and he described the situation in UK both good uh, and bad. Our next speaker would be uh, Jason Ma, uh, who is the founder and CEO and chief mentor of uh, 3EQ and acclaimed author, young leaders, a member of the B20 and G20 USA. He'll be joining us uh, by, uh, by Zoom, I think. Yeah, Jason. Yes, I am. Uh, can you guys hear me uh, clearly? Nice and clear? I can hear you, yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, it's, uh, it's an honor and pleasure to speak again. Uh, Dr. Michael Yao and I were old friends, and he's been kind enough to invite me to speak for the past eight or nine years to the World Chinese Economic Summit. Uh, I guess the name has changed recently. Uh, congratulations to Michael and the team for that. Uh, Chinese dias diaspora, I guess I'm probably the minority here. Um, as a global Chinese American, an immigrant from uh, Hong Kong way back in the 70s, I've been in the U.S. for 48 years, 49 years so far. Um, I know I, I look a little bit younger than I am, but I'm a thousand years old, just like a lot of Chinese, right? It's a joke. Um, I've been a, I've been very lucky. I think uh, you know the the overseas Chinese or the Chinese Americans in in the U.S. There's only about five million. There's not that many. And there are probably a little bit over 20 million uh, Asian Americans in general. So Chinese probably has the biggest slice. Uh, the second, close second, maybe the same is Filipino. And then you have uh, Indians, Koreans, Vietnamese, Japanese, etc. Uh, it's a very diverse uh, population. As for myself, after I graduated UC Berkeley back in 1984 uh, with an engineering degree, I did engineering, I did uh, kind of sales and marketing, it's all technology. 
and uh, I've been very lucky to start doing international business. And I ended up running Asia Pacific, uh, including Greater China, the mainland Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, you know, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, certainly Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, Philippines, and Indian subcontinent, uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Australasia, Australia, New Zealand. So, and I did it for a long, long time. I traveled close to 3 million miles, I think, over the past five decades. So I've seen the world a bit, uh, went into China uh, so many times, I lost track, a lot of Beijing. And uh, especially when I was running tech companies, and I, I remember back in the early 70s, back early 90s, uh, one of the communications equipment company I ran with a rep office in the Citic building in Beijing, you know, way back in the early mid 90s, there's not that many high rises, right? And I looked down from uh, the 11th floor rep office and I still see people burning coal and all that. Fast forward to decades later, look at how advanced China, Beijing is, it's pretty amazing. And I remember I, we were selling, uh, providing uh, mobile wireless communications equipment and systems to China Telecom. And that was even before China Mobile spun out of China Telecom. So I saw all that happen. And over the years, I did different tech companies, took care of China, uh, went back to Hong Kong many, many times. And I went back to Hong Kong over a hundred times. Uh, China lost track as well. Um, and I really enjoy uh, taking care of, you know, fellow Chinese uh, market, uh, sort of, I'm hearing a bit of an echo here. Uh, so, you know, I, I really enjoy taking care of uh, international markets, uh, certainly including China and, and, and Hong Kong. And uh, when it comes to China, uh, a, a while back, I was lucky to also have uh, co-founded two Chinese companies, tech companies, uh, Beijing operations, and of course, from a legal standpoint, as an American, you know, kind of international investors, uh, it's very normal to do the holding company in Cayman Islands to hold the equity, uh, but the operations and, you know, we pay taxes on a monthly basis, but we, uh, you know, make sure that we are compliant and, and respect the, the government and, and I took care of a Chinese market based on the categories that we we're in. And I was lucky to exit from one way back. Um, Today I have, uh, today I, I, I run my little family business called 3EQ and I'm also building another tech company uh, as well as advising a bunch of other tech and science companies. I'm very big on education. One thing that I noticed is that with my previous education company, um, I was lucky to bring in even uh, Eric Yuan, the founder of Zoom, which we're using right now, who's an old friend of mine. Um, and as a, as a, into the board of my previous education company that were, uh, run by, uh, we co-founded it run by immigrant Chinese Americans. So most of the clients we had, even in the U S were actually immigrant, uh, Chinese families or, uh, Chinese families, plus some sprinkling of other you know, Indians, Koreans, and Caucasian. And it's very interesting to observe that so many, so many families that we took care of, uh, a lot of the dads are still working in China, but the mom and the kids are in the U.S. or U.K. or or Southeast Asia. You know, it's actually a very common uh, combination, at least back then when I was running a company. Um, so a lot of stories to tell. I, we don't have time for that. Maybe we'll save it for another time. Um, today, I do speaking, uh, education, doing tech. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a person that really believe in creating a bigger pie together. So hopefully we could add to the peace and prosperity and joy, uh, and the mutual learning and growth to everyone. I'm very big on that. And I feel that part of my own, uh, mission is to really groom and, and, uh, secure the success of part of the next generation. So that the world will prosper, be safer, be, you know, more peaceful, uh, you know, and being, being a, a Chinese by blood, I'm sure that a lot of us or most of us could, could empathize that it's important to value family, education, connection, and pro-business. 
And that hasn't really changed. So uh, for me, I like to integrate the best of the Chinese values, especially the family values, with the American sort of dy uh, dynamic uh, entrepreneur. So I'm so kind of become a bit multicultural myself and be very embracive and very open to the world, uh, especially as a member of the D20, which is the uh, official G20 global uh, engagement group that represents the global business community and or the private sector. I see a, a few things out there and sitting on a future work and education task force while also observing digital transformation, energy sustainability, climate, and trade and investment. I learned a few things at a G20 level. Uh, so, you know, the world is a bit uh, ever changing, as we know, right? It's a bit turbulent, but I'm uh, optimistic and also practical at the same time. So I encourage uh, everyone to have a good, good hearted, uh, kind, of, kind of more and more global mindset and uh, help each other, definitely. So is that okay? Is that good enough? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jason, share with us uh, some of the characteristics of the Chinese community in the United States, his experience in China over a few decades, uh, especially running tech companies, and he would like to see Chinese values uh, combining with uh, the U.S. entrepreneurial dynamism. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker, but of course not the least speaker, is my good friend, Datu Dr. Chin Yu Sing JP. Uh, let's see what uh, he was going to share with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kong. Before I'm talking about this uh, Chinese culture and Chinese way of doing business, we must talk about this uh, Chinese civilization. Chinese civilization is the only country in the world that has a continuous history of 5,000 years compared with other old dynasty like in the old India, this uh, old Egypt and this uh, old Iraq. Iraq is uh, last time they call it Babylon. There's a song Babylon. So all this uh, classical civilization all no more. You look at the India culture, their previous uh, culture is not really the present culture because they were conquered by this alien. Alien destroy all their previous uh, Hindu culture or this Indian culture. And this uh, Egyptian culture also not, was not the same. It's not the same as the previous culture because this Egyptian country was conquered by this uh, Persian country. That means present day we call the Iran, Iran country. And this, uh, similarly for this uh, Iraq also. So the, the whole culture was destroyed. The whole race was conquered by this uh, Persian country also, the present day Iran. So China, we have a continuous culture of more than 5,000 years. Why only Chinese or China can survive for more than about 5,000 years? The civilization never conquered by any people or never sort of uh, totally sort of uh, destroy the whole culture. Then we can see, I say Chinese, we don't look Chinese as a race. Chinese actually is a culture. Because, uh, to, to, because in China, you know that there are 56 uh, different kind of group of people in China. There's not only one Ch Chinese Han people. See? There are so many other minorities. So that's why to, China, to Chinese, the definition is something, whoever practice Chinese culture is called a Chinese, not because of your look. Because you know this, in Xinjiang, there, the, they actually don't look like Chinese also. They look like Turkish or Middle East, Eastern people. So to China, to Chinese, is a culture, it's not a race. So that's why China, why they can survive so long without being a sort of a conquered completely by other countries. Even during the Japanese occupation, also only about three quarters of the China was conquered by Japan. But there's one place, uh, Chongqing, still not conquered by this uh, Japan. So we have to look at the culture, why they can survive. So there's a reason why 
you know, talk about Chinese culture, first thing you must look at how the Chinese culture come about. Chinese culture is talk about peacefulness. Because why this uh, Xi Huang Ti in the 2000 years ago, they built this uh, Great Wall? It was only for self defense. They are not going to attack any people. You are not attacking any people, then your own country also won't be destroyed by other people. That means all the while China, Chinese people fighting among each other. Uh, they only change the dynasty. But they are not really conquered by any other foreigners. Uh, this is a, the reason why the Chinese always practice uh, what I call the self-defense mentality. Chinese, they are not attacking any people. Because look at the old ancient classical book on this uh, Chinese culture, how they come about. Because Chinese culture always talk about how to use uh, classical Chinese to educate our people. Uh, this is uh, the, come, the, the meaning of this, uh, what called the culture. And the culture, our, this uh, Chinese culture is based on this agriculture. Always they go for self-cultivation, self-sufficiency, -suff they don't need to attack people to get their goods or different from other type of people. Uh. Western culture, according to the Greek, the, the letter is called actually original from cultivation. Cultivation means that you go and uh, conquer the environment in order to get something. That means you cultivate something like cultivate something, you, you grow something from the soil. So this one is something like a bit about conquering, talking about aggression, all these things. Chinese culture never practice about this aggression thing. They only talk about peacefulness, call assistance, call assistance. Because Chinese always talk about the the heaven, the people, and the earth. Always how talk about three things combined together. Chinese is called Tian Ren He Yi La. So that means that how to combine with the heaven and the earth in order to live peacefully on this earth. So that's why Chinese culture always talk about peacefulness, how to how to achieve win-win situation. So that's why this uh, because of this uh, Chinese culture. That's why. This is the only culture that can last for more than 5,000 years old. I cannot talk so long about this thing, like, because if I talk so long, then I cannot talk about other things, so I will talk about this thing. Then later on, uh, Chinese uh, as a culture, there is in, uh, a touch a little bit about Chinese culture. Then, then from here, how this uh, overseas Chinese come about? According to the, our, this, uh, the, the Chinese, the San, the doctor San Yi Sing, the, I mean the, the founder of New China, the founder of the Kuomintang China, I mean before the Communist China, he said wherever there is sea water, they are Chinese. So Chinese actually is uh, spread all over the world in 130 countries. 130 countries. So wherever you go, you can see Chinese. I think Chinese is the only what I call race that is well, very much well connected in the, th in the whole world. That's why just now Dr. O say bamboo network. It's, uh, this is what meaning. Uh, that means uh, they even call this a uh, Chinese Commonwealth. We got the British Commonwealth. Actually, now we have a Chinese Commonwealth. Because Chinese can be found in 130 countries. US uh, one, one of the top five in the world. They, I think got four, four more than four million Chinese staying there. Malaysia, we have about 7 million Chinese. Indonesia, you, you got more, you about, I think got 11 million or something like that. Uh, this, uh, Thailand also got about 8 million people staying there. So Chinese are very well connected. Actually, most of the overseas Chinese, 70% they are staying in the Southeast Asian countries. So most of the, the, the Chinese, the most populated one area is in Southeast Asia. So Chinese, uh, because of their culture, that's why Chinese, Chinese are very adaptable in any environment. Because you look at the history of China, it's not easy to survive for 5,000 years you know, because there are so many calamities like earthquake la, and then you've got so many like, like this uh, hunger and you've got so many calamities like this uh, flood, everything. There's, that's why Chinese, uh, they are very resilient. They can survive in any situation because they are very adaptable. adaptable. And then also one thing also because Chinese, they don't really have their own religion. What I mean is that compared with this uh, Islam or compared with Christianity or compared with other, 
Buddhism or what. Chinese uh, basically, they don't really uh, believe in this, uh, what call the religion. Uh, they got their own religion. We pray to our ancestor. Uh, they want to uh, more to Taoism or something like that, but also not really Taoism also, but it's praying to our ancestor. That's why, because of this uh, thing, that's why Chinese are very flexible. If you are too religious, uh, then you are very dogmatic, then you can't uh, be so flexible, you see? it's not so acceptable in any environment. That's the reason why you can see Chinese can survive in any country without any problem. So this is the reason why Chinese uh, can do so well in so many countries, in South Asian countries. In, in Philippines, according to a study, they only got 1% population, but they control about 60% of the economics of the country. Uh, in, in Indonesia, 3% of the population controls 70% of the, the country economics. So uh, I think uh, this is fantastic because of all this uh, Chinese culture. Apart from this adaptability, they are very flexible, very good in networking. Of course, uh, they are very careful in spending their money, all these things. So all these are the Chinese good culture. So that's why the Chinese uh, they are doing very well. And then also Chinese uh, way of management. They are using part of this uh, Chinese culture, the, the old ways of doing business, because Chinese got one uh, goddess of, well, god of merchant, few thousand, about 3,000 years ago. That's, uh, actually, a lot of Chinese, overseas Chinese learn a lot from him. So they say when you got uh, 10 million your capital, but you don't borrow more than 5 million dollars. That means uh, you only borrow half, because you still got, your asset is 10 million, you only borrow half. That means your gearing is only 0 0.5 very safe. You over borrowing, your, your this uh, business can, can collapse very fast. So this is a way of doing things. Always Chinese always uh, talking about this, uh, something like you talk about humanitarian approach. This Western management talking about more rational approach. So the humanitarian approach, always Chinese always talk about guanxi or relationship first. They only talk about rationality and talk about legal. That's why Chinese ne seldom go to court to get the, the thing they want. Uh. Normally, they try to negotiate. If last resort, only talk about law or legal way. But for the Western way of doing things, you see, everything go by the black and white first. Always go by the litigation first. They only talk about rationality. The last portion, we talk about the, the what I call the relationship. So this is an entirely two different system. And the Chinese way is more the humanitarian kind of uh, approach of manage, manage, managing a company. This Western way is something like they are using the systematic way or scientific way of managing. They are using a very good, very, very good system to run the, the company. So I feel the two systems also got problems, got, got weaknesses. The best one is to combine the two systems. That's why now a lot of overseas Chinese, especially those educated in the Western country one, so normally they would practice part of the way they use a humanitarian approach how to treat their staff so that the, the relationship between the, the boss and the staff will be better. But there must be some system also or there must be some rewards and punishment also. If not, the company cannot be run properly. So that is very important. So that's why uh, how these Chinese uh, can do so well in this, uh, this modern day because they combine both the Chinese management and the Western management. That's why they are doing quite well. And so during the Chinese open, China open up the time, more than 70% of this uh, investment all come from this overseas Chinese, especially from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, and, some, and Indonesia, Thailand, all these countries. So that's why the, 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 in 1970, when China opened up the time, if not because of this overseas Chinese, the, the, the same culture, you see, because they always think that uh, they must help their own, what you call their, 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 their what you call the, the, the countries where their parents come from, they must help this country because of this uh, thinking, that's why the blood relationship, all these things. So that's why China can be so successful within 40 years and become the world number two. I think in another, two zero, now it's 2022. China could be the largest economy in 2028, six years later, because of COVID-19. So I think China, China can overtake U.S. faster. By right, it should take about until 2032, according to my calculation.
But now because of this uh, COVID-19 issue, maybe in 2028, China will become the largest economy in the world. I think this one, you can't stop it because uh, the trend is already there already. Now you see so many uh, Western countries try to break ties with China, they find they cannot because without China, the market there, they cannot survive also. That's why you can see the, the, the premier of German, Germany, they have to go, recently went to China to talk about business, bring around about 12 uh, top investors in China to talk about business. Even the French president going to China maybe next year. So I think the, you can't really stop the China progress. So that's why uh, this is the, what I call the trend that you cannot stop. And then we just now talk about the China way of... To China, all the while, they are all, all doing well. Only now, is China only come back to their original position. Because in, before 1986, China was number one in the whole world. Right? Think in terms of GDP, GDP, population, everything, they are they were world number one. Only thing, after 1986, because of the, uh, the what I call the country, they're not really doing very well. That's why the, the Manchurian dynasty that affected I mean, the downfall of China. But China uh, really tried to regain their position. So I think uh, this sort of trend, because China is a long history country, more than 5,000 years. So to them, this is only one of the uh, cycle only. Huh? You talk about other European, uh, this US, they only got about 200 over years history. UK, of course, uh, longer, a uh, few thousand years, so two, three thousand years. So I think uh, uh, China will get its rightful place in when time is come. So I think uh, with, with this thing, so I will say, this, uh, in this uh, era, China will become very strong. So I think nobody can live without China market. So no matter how you try to stop it, you, can, you cannot. Because Chinese people are very hardworking, very innovative, and they're willing to suffer when the country is not doing well. When they're getting stronger, they will try to... Uh, because according to a study, uh, the Chinese, uh, they are considered the most intelligent people in the world in, because a lot of many studies, even the Singaporean Chinese also, uh, Hong Kong people also Chinese. So according to the study in the, all the world universities, the top universities there, all the top scholars are Chinese. So, and then the talk about doing business, there are two types of people that are very good in doing business. One is the Jews, another is Chinese. Jews are very smart because they, are right, they control the, the Wall Street, you see. So, these Jews people, that's why there's a saying, la, I don't know true or not, la, they say, Jews people are too smart, people whenever they try to do business with Jews people, they try to be very careful. When they do business with Chinese, your Chinese people are really humble and really low profile. So, Chinese always say, pretending like a pig in order to eat a tiger. Ah, ban ji se lo fu ah. So, in, at the end of the day, Chinese are the one to make most of the money. The Jewish people can't make a lot of money because everybody tends to be careful of, of these Jewish people. Because that's why, that's because of Chi Jewish people are too smart during the Nazis' uh, time. So many Jews were killed by these uh, Nazis also. So there's a thing, uh, I mean, the two different cultures, both also are considered smart people. That's why, uh, no doubt, this, uh, all the big corporations are run by Jewish people. There's no doubt about it. But Chinese is more on the SME. All the, the, the what I call the, the use the uh, networking, the bamboo network or Chinese com Commonwealth to uh, penetrate into all sector of the <coughs> economic in, in, in the country where they are reciting. You see? So that's why the, our former Prime Minister Dr. Mahadi also say, don't Dr. Mahadi say, all these uh, Southeast Asian countries without Chinese, they wouldn't be so developed nowadays. I think it, what he say is correctly because you know the the, the Chinese contribution to this uh, the country development is very great. I think I'm over time here, so I better stop thinking. Uh, thank you, uh, Datu, Dr. Chin. <laughs> he mentioned the continuous Chinese civilization over the centuries. Uh, that uh, being Chinese is a cultural attribute and not a racial one that uh, Chinese uh, treasures peacefulness, win-win situation, that overseas Chinese are very often very well connected, and this, uh, this desire to combine 
the humanitarian approach of the Chinese with the systematic management of the West. So, excuse me. So now we are into a question and answer. Any question from the floor? Anybody? Okay, if not, let me raise a question to Edmund first. You mentioned China is the future. Why would you say so? Your country doesn't seem to be very agreeable to that. China is the future because uh, in the context of uh, the United Kingdom, don't forget we just had Brexit two, three years ago. <laughs> And uh, just after that, there was this uh, COVID uh, and the pandemic. So in the context of UK, UK needs friends, not enemies. So politically, we have had our challenges. And uh, our most recent prime minister now even talk about, talk, talk tough about not being friendly with China. But like our fellow speaker said, you cannot avoid the fact that the 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 uh, consumption and the manufacturing and the production capacity of and the capability of China surpasses even the whole block of Europe, all right, and obviously nearer home here in the Far East, all right, we look to China for trade as well, and this is what I think UK in terms of the not just Chinese diaspora but it, the trading the business community do know that there, there, there is an answer in looking towards China rather than looking towards themselves in Europe. They are in the doldrums, right? From Germany to you, you name it, they're in the doldrums. So I'm convinced China is the future. Okay. Okay, any question from the floor? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very humble indeed. Uh, okay, perhaps a question for Jason uh, online, if Jason is still there. You mentioned a uh, possibility of combining Chinese values with U.S. entrepreneurial dynamism. Now that U.S. and China look set to uh, decouple from each other economically, politically, strategically, would you think this is still possible? I think um, where I'm coming from is really, <clears throat> is really within the individual, not so much on the country level and within the family. Um, just like part of what my colleagues have said, it is wise to have, I call it uh, creative combinations, where if you could blend the best of the East, Chinese, in the West, and you integrate that into your own personal operating system, into your own values and principles, and how you think, uh, I think that, that could be pretty powerful, you know? So, especially uh, now the world's pretty global, as, as, as you know, and uh, the world is quite uh, cross-cultural if you want to do business. Um, Overseas Chinese, like uh, my colleagues have said, are pretty uh, smart. Uh, I think the wisdom level is uh, not low. And if you take the overseas Chinese population today, my rough guess is probably close to 60 million people. I think it's probably already one of the top five or six uh, countries, if it's a country by itself, in terms of total GDP size, my rough guess. And of course, the biggest chunk is in Southeast Asia, and uh, the rest of the overseas Chinese are spread all over. Um, I, you know, I, I do business with so many people, so many countries, including China, Southeast Asia. I love Southeast Asia. Um, and one thing that I find is doing business with fellow uh, ethnic Chinese across the world, it's actually pretty easy, <laughs> you know? We kind of get each other. Um, we share similar values, even though 
you know, uh, your, 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 your accent might be a little bit different, right? And, and it makes it kind of easy. You know, when I go to Indonesia, go to Malaysia, go to Thailand, go to Singapore, uh, go to China, different parts of China. China is actually very diverse, as you know, culturally. There are subcultures as well. And, you know, Beijing culture is different than Shanghai culture. And there are subcultures even within uh, Shanghai. And when I go to Hong Kong, then I speak my fluent Cantonese, right? It's a different, it's really the appreciation and understanding of uh, others. And what can we do? What can I do to serve and sort of be compassionate and take care of them for a win-win? Uh, that could be practical, or it could be intangible. So personally, I'm very big on to, I'm very big on, on long-term relationship. Uh, if you really truly make friends with uh, Jason Ma, with me, I tend to like to keep you for as a long-term friend. That's how I am. You know, we could be competitors uh, next time in business, but I still look at you as a friend or as a connection. I, I think that's uh, actually a very core uh, Chinese value in some ways, you know? So, I encourage, uh, you know, uh, what, what I do throughout the world, I'm very blessed to be recognized as the chief mentor of next gen leaders in many different circles. And I encourage uh, people to really keep uh, learning and growing and contributing and, and, and never stop learning and growing. Chinese like to learn. Um, and and smart uh, Westerners like to learn as well, but Chinese by far, uh, similar to Indians, okay, and Koreans too. And, you know, overall, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm inspired to be an overseas uh, Chinese. I'm very lucky to be living in a Silicon Valley in California. Uh, California by, it's only 40 million in population, but it's actually the fifth largest economy in the world. And I think we may be surpassing uh, Germany in the due course. I think technology, entertainment is really, you know, it's it's a uh, common knowledge, uh, the agriculture, etc. So my family are my 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 children. They are American born, uh, but uh, certainly they understand the uh, the parental respect and <laughs> that, and we search for a grandparent. So so that that that's a very uh, Chinese value very much a Chinese value, so. Thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, this must be one of the most uh, philosophical sessions I've ever moderated. Uh, again, any question from the floor? Okay, then I throw something at Albert. Oh, sorry, there is, okay. Please. That is a mic, right? So my, my name is Irene Wong. I'm from Hong Kong, okay, and I'm from the fintech industries and previously from the um, finance industry. Uh, my question, first of all, is uh, while we are talking about um, sustainability within the region, especially just now saying that the Chinese uh, do not like you know, to, uh, to invade others and uh, obtain the, the things that they want. They want to build a sustainable you know, um, circle themselves. So in uh, today's world, uh, what kind of resources or, um, uh, or, or agricultural you know, products that you think the Asia, if we are working together as a whole, will still lack of or um, um, uh, short of you know, um, even if we are trying to, you know, build a sustainable circle within the ASEAN region. So that is the first question. Second question is uh, regarding about uh, the definition of wealth. So um, in the past uh, 30 years, the capital markets has um, developed um, in a way um, with the very um, rapid expansion of the PE level, especially in some um, uh, markets. Uh, in particular, the U.S. market, uh, the stock market. And this creates a new definition of wealth, right? Because once you create the wealth, you can use the money to buy property and land, okay? And China, um, um, which is different from maybe other countries, is uh, it has a very strict policy on selling of land. They don't sell land. They just sell land, the use of land's rights. Okay, and I think this is how, you know, they keep their 
uh, uh, um, the, 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 the resource is self-contained. Okay. But uh, the thing is, because of the uh, financial market development uh, in the past 20 years, including the tsunami, financial tsunami, and uh, now you know, the, with the digital asset uh, development, so there's all kind of you know, money. Uh, we, we call it the money coming from a new, new kind of, um, we call it GDP. So the GDP, which is coming from the expansion of the values of something that is uh, 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 from, the, from the expansion of the multiple and the capital markets, rather than from the fundamentals of um, uh, the working of the people or um, the production of the land. So how would you see, you know, in Asia, uh, you know, as a region, uh, on the sustainability when comparing with uh, the U.S. market, right? Because their market is expanding, the wealth is expanding, while no matter how hard this area is working, you know, in terms of uh, the productivity, you know, you will still be the lagging, lagger, you know, if the capital market is not expanding quick enough to produce the wealth. So that's, that's my second question. Thank you. And let me see whether I get the questions right. Mm. The first question is about uh, whether, uh, what, what, what is lacking in Asia? The in resources. Huh? The res resources. The, the, the resources. Resources. Mm. Well, what do you mean by resources? Uh, physical resources? For example, food. Some kinds of oh, food products, okay, some okay. kinds of uh, okay, okay, uh, minerals, okay. some kinds okay. of. Uh, okay, you want a you want a very technical answer like that. Okay, what is lacking in Asia? Okay, uh, the second question is, uh, I think physical versus virtual wealth. I think the the gist of the question is something like the U.S. is very good at creating virtual wealth. Uh, perhaps uh, we should somehow catch up or uh, else. Not uh, not only U.S. but also some parts of the. No, uh, in, in other yeah, cities. Okay, yeah. okay. Anybody would like to take up these questions? US, US actually, why US economy still can sustain because of the US dollar? Because everybody needs to use US dollar to buy the commodities. So that's why there's a reason why, again, US is having deficit, trade deficit. And this uh, what I call the budget deficit for so many years. Why this uh, U.S. still can sustain? Mainly because U.S. is an international currency, so everybody need to use. Whether the country is doing well or not, but people still need to use the currency. That's why now when U.S. raise the currency, so many country go bankrupt. The first country is Sri Lanka. So because when the thing U.S. dollar gets so expensive, you import. It's getting so expensive because your currency is devalued. So you need to pay more money to buy goods or buy the oils, oil products, oil and gas products. So there's a reason why many countries are suffering. US basically, I would say, is a virtual economy. So they have, all the while, they make their wealth from this uh, service economy. It's different from China. China, they make their wealth from this production. I think China is a more like a production-driven country. So U.S. is basically, they're talking about financial market, Wall Street. So the grading, actually their GDP, how they calculate also very funny one, you know. Lah. So they even use, a, you will buy a house, wah, how to go to, to mortgage, and then you, you still cal calculate that one as part of the, uh, the, 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 I mean the, the production, lah, the, the one's called GDP, cross domestic product, they all added it together. So actually more than 80% of the uh, wealth actually is dependent on the service industry or something that, you cannot see. Huh? It's, it's invisible. You cannot see one. Not like China one, they produce matches for you, for produce a glass, also they are physical. You can hold it. <coughs> you can see it. So I, I would say there are two different systems. But China, but US now is suffering also. You know their debt is so high. Huh? Recently it came out with uh, three, 31 trillion. It's the highest. I don't know they, whether they have... I think now the government also having difficulty how to pay salary to their government servant no? because they only, their limit is up already. The real limit is 31.4 trillion. So they are borrowing the loan is already maximum already. Unless 
the Congress and the Senate going to raise the what I call their renting limit. If not, they will have difficulty to pay the salary also. They cannot borrow money anymore because all the while they try to print money. So this one, this sort of economy, I will say, is a is very dangerous one because any economy you must be supported by physical <coughs> physical things. Without physical thing, uh, you cannot sustain one. Just like look at Dubai. Last time Dubai built a lot of this building. Uh. Huh? But later on, no investment, nobody want to come in, so how? So the whole, whole economy also collapsed. Uh. So that's why any country you want to develop, you must follow the proper step. You cannot just straight away you go to service industry. You, cannot. you must have manufacturing. Manufacturing is the really physical things that can really support the economy because actually manufacturing should be the core uh, what called engine of the development economic development of country because without manufacturing base the service industry is supposed to support the manufacturing base not the other way around see but us is different they try to do constant con uh, I mean, focus on this uh, service industry they all this manufacturing industry they just uh, ask them to go to china go to vietnam go to malaysia go to uh, other uh, Southeast Asian country, so they want they don't want to have this uh, labor intensive industry. So now they are suffering. So they they got not enough job for 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 to, for their people, no, because the manufacturing can employ many people. Uh. So the only you go to service industry, you don't need so many people. Uh. Uh, you are financial uh, lady. I think I talk to you about <laughs> something. So I think uh, that's why uh, now U.S. actually economies. I will I will say economy. U.S. economy is declining. You cannot be reversed already. China definitely would overtake uh, this uh, U.S. because U.S. economy is basically service-driven industry. You know? They all based on the, the Wall Street, the share market. All these are really virtual ones, you see. It's the paper money, you know. We are not creating any physical wealth, you know. That is a problem. And then once people try to not to use U.S. dollar as the international currency, so the U.S. economy will not be doing well. So now, so many countries, they go for digital kind of currency already. This Russian, China, they also got digital LMP. They try to use their own currency to, to do business with each other. Malaysia also try to uh, do business with, with this China by using LMP. Even the Australian, they want to sell coal to, to, to this or iron ore to China. They have to use LMP also. So I think this is a trend of the country. Because you look at the history, uh, 500 years ago, the international currency is uh, the Dutch uh, currency, you know. Later on, then the British uh, currency, huh? then later on, U this uh, US. Later on, multiple currency, I wouldn't say the people will learn that. So now, normally when a country, they are number one trading nation in the world, now China is number one trading nation in the world. So now later, their currency will become very major one, it's definitely, because US, before US was number one, Dutch was number one trading nation in the world. Then second, then later on, UK. UK was the number one trading nation in the world. Later on, after the Second World War, US became the number one trading nation in the world. Now China has already become the number one trading nation in the world. So once you become number one trading nation in the world, you've got a bargaining power to talk to your trading partner. China is one is considered, I think most of the country, they are number one uh, trading nation partner, you see. Malaysia also, ASEAN also, even so many European countries also, I think, getting to be number one already. So most of the, I think, out of, uh, I think, 150 countries doing business with China, most of them, China is their number one trading partner, you know. So China got the leverage uh, to ask all these countries to use their own currency to do business, especially the Minbi. That's why I will see this uh, US currency, whether you like it or not, it will decline. No. There's no way to return already unless, uh, I mean, academics say, speaking, uh, Chinese, this U.S. will start a war to, to prevent all these things from happening. Uh, but I think this is very unlikely that nowadays you talk about nuclear war, uh, you can't win the war. Nobody can win the war say, among the superpower. So I think uh, the trend, you cannot be reversed already because uh, this, China, this U.S. economy is too, what I call, dependent on service industry. So now they are regretting, but too late already. So are the, pre the previous president, Donald Trump, or now the present president, they also try to encourage these, uh, these uh, US people to go back to the to, to US to, to do manufacturing. But very, very difficult, very, very US there, the cost of production is so high, how to sustain? You cannot, you cannot 
cannot be competitive also once you produce the thing. So now they force, try to force all these uh, the semiconductor chip makers to, to produce in, China, in US, I think. Uh, not, not so easy also. La. So that's why I think, uh, uh, so I will answer like that. Uh, yeah, that's all the time we have and the music uh, shows it. So let's give a big hand to all our speakers. And thank you to, uh, for, for, for staying this long. Thanks.